Welcome. Thank you all for coming, and uh, hopefully you will enjoy today's first session of Alumni Life. Uh, it is a new platform where we uh, we hope that alumni, students, faculty, <laughs> sorry for saying the last, uh, will meet, talk about their experience, uh, the, and uh, basically share what you can do after you finish SERGI. Yes, there is a life after SERGI. <laughs> Uh, we are both uh, <laughs> kind of like uh, show, here to show that there is a life after CGI. And we are really proud that the first uh, first alumni life will be with a member of the first uh, cohort that entered uh, CGI in 1991. <laughs> uh, so Mr. Jan Poniowski. So he entered uh, CGI in 1991 and it's works were on the labor markets in transition, right? And uh, since 2005, so that's uh, that approximately 18 years, 17 years right now, he's working for European Commission, first within the Eurostat, so that's the statistical office of the uh, EU, and uh, next uh, for the publication office, am I correct? Uh, correctly, of the European Union. And so today he will be speaking about his experience while working, how he got there, uh, what are the projects that they are doing, uh, what are the possibilities for you to either access data or maybe work there afterwards. So that's, uh, that's also an interesting part. And uh, you might have, uh, re might remember him uh, those of you who are here slightly longer, because he was coming for every gala. <laughs> for every gala, he is probably the, uh, one of our best members of the alumni community. So really, uh, we are glad that you came. And a few organizational notes uh, to, to, to conclude. The presentation will be around 40 minutes. Uh, there are no questions uh, during the presentation because there will be like 20 minute session afterwards if, or 20 minutes are reserved. It doesn't have to be that long and it can be longer. And afterwards for like informal questions, uh, there is time to uh, stand outside and have a coffee and small snacks and, and this kind of stuff. So uh, that's all from me. Uh, thank you again for coming. And the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. It's a great pleasure for me to be here with you today. It's really, I. It's really 30 years ago I was sitting in this room trying to connect to internet. This was our computer room and now I'm really amazed by this excellent technology we have here and this is really enabling us to connect all around the world. So I, I'm really glad to see you here. I will speak about my experience in the European Union institutions. Uh, I came from Luxembourg today, and uh, it's it's really a great opportunity to to be again together in physical meetings because two years or two, two and a half years of Corona disconnected us in the real life. So we have not had so many opportunities to meet in person, and I'm really glad that this EU back to you initiative is also back again because uh, this was a long tradition in the European Commission to to organize such such an event for EU staff, but it was not possible during the last two years, or there were some limited online. So back to university or back to back to school is an initiative sponsored by Digicom, Digicommunication and Permanent Representation uh, a Delegation of EU to, to Prague, which is actually supporting this event by promote, pro providing some publications. You can you can take them. I, I also brought some of them, but they are all available online as well. So I am coming to speak in my, let's say, own individual capacity. My agenda is not any political agenda. It's really about my real work, uh, daily experience with the, with the institutions I, I used to work. This was Eurostat and publications office in the, of the EU which is my current employer. Um, before I start, uh, can I ask you how many of you are coming from outside outside the EU? Could you raise your hands? Okay, good, good. Because the first part of my presentation is really about how, how EU is functioning and what are the main institutions of the EU. So uh, 
on the right hand side you can see that there is a concept of uh, of rotating presidencies uh, we are now in second half of 2022 and this is Czech Republic this is second time since Czech Republic joined the EU they are presiding a rotating presidency of the European Council. So it's, it's a prime minister of Czech Republic who is chairing the meetings of all heads of governments of 27 member states of the EU. And they are usually organized in, in tri trios, so one, one, one uh, before and one after. So it's France, Czech Republic and Sweden who are forming program together for this trio of presidency. Then Spain will follow and other countries. The, the list is predefined quite long term ahead like 10 years it's already uh, clear here i have some recollections from nice <laughs> memories of of my previous participation it was first time in uh, 2011 when when there was 20 20th anniversary of cgi so dima shemetilo victor chistiako i just read recently that he has established alumni community in benelux i i might try to contact him because it's not far from where i am this is my good friend, William Druska. He works in Qatar now uh, for telecom. It, it was also very interesting remembrance when we met in Pittsburgh when I was there doing part of my studies and some, some people you might know uh, around. <laughs> it's really nice to see you here again. Uh, my, my short seat, yes? I want to say that I was not drunk, I was just dancing a lot. Of course, of course. <laughs> Nobody is still. Uh, just very short CV. I, I graduated from a faculty of electrical engineering in 1991 in Bratislava, June 91 and July. The same year, I just started my preparatory semester here in Prague. Took four years, then it included uh, our studies in Institute of Advanced Studies in Vienna in 93-94, where I first time met Michal, and <laughs> since then we are good friends. Then I also had opportunity to study at the University of Pittsburgh under the supervision of Jan Schweiner uh, for one, one semester. I wish to mention that the company Treksima Bratislava was a very rich source of data for my research, and I am greeting my colleagues in Treksima because I know they are connected online, I pro propose them to connect, so this is a really great opportunity to have people also connected remotely. After 10 years of hard studies, I finally graduated in 2001, but in the meantime I was already working for an American company, which is called uh, Kimberly Clark in my hometown in Slovakia. Seven years of really nice managerial experience with opportunities to travel to US quite regularly. We had headquarters in Tucson, Arizona, so it was also impressive <laughs> opportunity. Uh, since 2005, I am, I am working in Luxembourg. I moved with my family and kids. So we did, uh, I did like, 11 years in Eurostat. And then since 2017, I changed and I am, I am working uh, in, public, in the publications office of the EU. And since 2011, as it was already mentioned, I am gladly coming and supporting uh, Gala event in my presence, and it's, it's really, I hope this will become sooner or later. So, let me say a few words about EU institutions. I, I, I don't want to repeat what, what you can see on the, on the slides. You know, there are 27 member states. I, I would like to pick some, some more, let's say, interesting uh, facts about EU, for instance, here. This is French Guyana. So, not many people know that the French Guyana is also part of the EU. It's probably most distant part of EU where you can pay with euros. Uh, we, we have 24 languages, uh, we, including Maltese and Irish. So these are also languages of the EU. But on the other hand, Luxembourg, speaking Luxembourg is not really official language. Luxembourg is using French and German as official languages, but Luxembourgish spoken language is not official language of the EU yet, might be. Maybe it will come. 9th of May is uh, Europe Day. It's probably there is some... Yes, question? What is it right now? It's still official language. You know, Irish and Malta use English as official languages. 
So every member state's language is, is official language of the EU. And you are you have right to propose documents in your national language in other country, and you can, these documents are supposed to be accepted. Um, but uh, about 9th of May, uh, it is, it, there is some remembrance that uh, there is 8th of May, which is uh, end of war anniversary, but this is not really related to that. This is the anniversary of Schumann Declaration 1950. So this is the Europe Day where we have a we have day off in, in, in the institutions. Uh, okay, let's continue. This is, uh, this, this is some, let's say, basic uh, uh, introduction to, to three circles of European integration. Uh, the, this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this, this Turquoise color circle is EU, EU27, this is Eurozone, and this is Schengen, this, this, this yellow. As you can see, the highest level of integration, orange, covers all these countries, what you can see here. For instance, uh, this, this pink color, it's only one country, which means uh, this country is in, in, in the EU, 27, in Eurozone, but not in Schengen. This is Ireland. There is one country which will join this group next year. Do you know which one it is? Uh, it, it will be Croatia. 1st January 2023, Croatia is joining Eurozone. So this will be 20 country which will be using uh, Euro as their legal currency. Unfortunately, there are still some countries in the European Union which are not members of Schengen. So these three countries are on the waiting list quite a long time, Romania, Bulgaria and Croatia. Hopefully this is going to be ended soon. And then we have also another curiosity that we have countries like Iceland or Norway, which are part of Schengen. So if you are a member of European Union, you can travel to this country with your citizen's ID. You don't need any passport, no, no checks. You, you go like, there is free movement of people and everything. So even if they are not in EU, they are part of Schengen. The same information is also on the right-hand side, this country flex. So you see this, this, this point is a little bit unprecise. It's, it's somewhere here. Now you see the, the arrow is there, but <laughs> I don't want to make any political connotations, but it's not easy. I know the situation very well because my three kids are living in the UK and my sister lives in London for 17 years. So I'm watching the situation in the UK very closely. And I would say this is a very unfortunate situation as it's now. Uh, there is another movement in this map uh, because this map also contains member, uh, NATO countries. So as, as you know, uh, there is a uh, and NATO is going to be enlarged by Sweden and Finland, which were traditionally neutral countries. So uh, the, the other three NATO countries uh, which are not in the EU are, are United States, Canada, and, and also Turkey. So Turkey, this is the NATO dotted spots. You have some basic information there. Let me continue. This is a short history of EU. Uh, so. Uh, in, uh, EU was practically established in 1950 as as the result of negotiations between between the, the countries which were on the other side, opposite side after during the Second World War. It was Germany, Italy, and then Benelux countries and, 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 and France. So these six countries signed an agreement and they created European Co and Steel Community, and this was really the basics of European Union. This, this project was really a project about peace, not about, about so much economic, even many people thought. And then there was Euroatom created, which, which was really about peaceful use, utilization of nuclear energy. So this, this, uh, this was the beginning of European Union. There are important landmarks about enlargement. The last enlargement took place in July 2013 when Croatia joined and the last step which was Brexit happening on 31st, 31st of uh, January 2020. Uh, it was it was the uh, first time in history reduction of EU when UK opted out. So I don't uh, go more to the details. Here I, I wish to show you three. This is the aerial view of, of Brussels. If some of you have been in Brussels. You might, you might know that uh, this, this building here, uh, this is the, I mean, the labels there. Okay, so 
And here we have EU voice. This is the this is the seat of the European Commission, the Lamont building, famous Lamont, and this is this is a president of the European Commission, German national Ursula von der Leyen. She was previously uh, working as a minister of defense of German government. Then we have a heads of state. This is Council of the European Union. This is uh, actually this day and yesterday there is a gathering of heads of state in Brussels. They are negotiating energy price uh, regulation. And then we have European Parliament here with the president Roberta Metzola, who only recently replaced Mr. Sassoli, who has died very unexpectedly one and a half year ago. Um, what is interesting on, on the, at the European Parliament, it has 705 seats representing all 27 member states. The representation is non-proportional, so small countries are relatively higher proportion than, than, than the bigger countries. Um, what is also interesting, European Parliament has two seats, one in, one in Brussels and one in Strasbourg, so they are moving and there is a big dis discussion now whether they should not reduce only to one place because, it, of course, this is a lot of cost related to this transfer. But at the moment, uh, it, it's a political, let's say, debate, and um, there, is, there is no, let's say, um, clear outcome whether it will move on day or not. But this is not all. European Parliament also sits in Luxembourg. There is a back office. We have translation services. A lot of translators work for European Parliament. Um, in, in Luxembourg. In Luxembourg, there is also a big concentration of other institutions, European Quarter, Kirchberg. Uh, there is a seat of European Court of Justice, European Court of Auditors, European Parliament, European Commission, Eu um, recently newly established uh, European Prosecutor's Office, and also uh, European Investment Bank. So all these institutions are located in one quarter of Luxembourg, employing thousands of people. So. It's, it, Luxembourg is, uh, is, is um, let's say, proposed to be a hub for three basic services of the Commission. This, this is the language translation. This is uh, legal. That's why we have court, courts there. And there is uh, there is an IT hub. So the digit 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 has its seat in Luxembourg, but also partially in, in Brussels. And we have Luxembourg is really very advanced in building data centers. This is also something. Uh, specific to Luxembourg. Okay, let me continue. Just for your impression, it's more than one trillion euros uh, to be to be spent for the period, or has been spent for the period 2014-2020. There are six basic, uh, let's say, spending areas, uh, which is uh, the, the green is uh, the green is uh, natural resources. So this is in principle common agriculture policy cap. This is a lot of money going to subsidize agriculture in you, and that's why maybe French wine is cheaper than Czech wine because they have <laughs> better subsidies. <laughs> and uh, here we have important for Eastern Europe or Central Eastern, this is cohesion funds. This is the construction of highways from EU money. Here we have, uh, we have some, let's say, help to third countries. Then this is about support of education and research, and this is uh, border protection and control. Maybe you know one of the famous agencies now being often mentioned is, is Frontex, which, which is very important. Indeed. And this is our cost of administration. Uh, it might seem that European institution employ too many people. It's 60,000 people working for commission institutions and agencies. There are about 50 agencies. Uh, such, such as Frontex. But if you compare it, for instance, with French administration, French ministries and government itself have 140,000 employees. So for managing the budget for 450 million inhabitants, it's probably not so inefficient as some people might see, but this is not to me to judge on that. Okay, here I am just trying to speak about European Commission priorities. There are six major priorities which are link to sustainable development goals of United Nations. So these this six priorities were formulated for the whole five-year period of the Commission 2019-2024. However, as we are suffering or we are witnessing very tragic and uh, 
very tragic war in Ukraine. Uh, we, we are seeing that the priorities are changing gradually, and this is now re reflected in the priorities of Czech presidency. So they include managing refugee crisis from Ukraine, energy security, strengthening Europe, defense capabilities, the democratic institutions. And this is not only about um, um, defense, but also <laughs> cyber security and, on, and, and resilience on economy, interconnections. So these are completely, let's say, new shifts, and these are really urgent topics which currently European Union is, is solving, and we see it every day. It is uh, prices of of uh, electricity and, and 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 gas are really growing out of control. <clears throat> so this was about the European institutions. Is there any question, or we we can leave it? I think after the after the whole presentation. So now I am going to speak about my personal experience. Uh, or let me just start with introduction. So this is this is the place where I am working in Luxembourg. It's it's quite old building which will be demolished ne next year, and <laughs> we will move to another. <laughs> this this, in, uh, this publications office. Uh, its main mission is to really produce a European official journal. Official journal of the EU is, is the legal document produced every day in 24 languages, and this is the, really the publishing of the European law. If there are sanctions to be implemented on EU level, it, it must be published in this journal, and then it, they are becoming law for all, all member states. Until 2013, it was really published every day. On paper, now electronic publication is accepted as, as, as a legal document, so there is special electronic signature and this, this is a proof of, uh, let's say, validity. This publication office is a uh, uh, central point of access to law and new publications, open data, research results, and procurement notices. I will speak about that later in my presentation. Just a curiosity, uh, I am from Slovakia. There are 22 Slovaks working for publications office, and three of them I, are from my hometown, Pishtani, so <laughs> I have some friends <laughs> found, found in the publications of their 18 checks. So they are quite well, pre well represented in, in comparison with total staff. Um, and uh, uh, what else? Uh, yes, I, I will speak about my personal uh, responsibility. So it, it's coming uh, with the with the this slide, it's uh, going to refer to several, let's say, websites. I am, I am currently in charge of OP portal. So this is the major dissemination channel of the publication office website of the house. And I am really there for technical, uh, let's say, support of this. Uh, we have to have portal up and running every day, 24-7. And we have to have it compliant with security, with access management. Uh, we, I will show you, you some interesting projects we are doing. But you have here all, all the important, let's say, out, outlets of the publications office plus supportive services. So this, this is the overview of, let's say, the, of the scope of our activities. Uh, here, a little bit from history, what is really publication, uh, meaning for different people, public may make things known and available. So from, from ancient... Uh, uh, Egyptian and Greek uh, products through the med medieval libraries. This is actually, if I'm not wrong, this is this is Trinity College Dublin, very nice library. I, I have been there in May, uh, so <laughs> uh, that that is really worth to visit. And then we had this print house from 20, 30 years ago, and now this is really what we are producing. We are producing our publications in traditional PDF, but also. HTML websites, print on demand. You can go to our website. You can ask. You want this map or publication, and it's delivered to you. And then EPUB. This is this is for uh, for uh, reading electronically on different devices. So there are different formats we are producing, and all in 24 languages. For this, is one of a very specific product which could be interesting for. For the researchers, this is about pro, uh, about uh, disseminating research results. I will show more details later. Everlex, this is just an example how this Everlex looks like in practice. So this is the official journal, and usually one one volume contains several legal acts. 
from from the next year we will publish a one 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 legal act will be one edition so it will be more flexible you don't need to wait and collect and publish but we publish one by one which will be a, of, of course more 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 demanding from from management of resources perspective but it will be faster for for the for the users this is general overview of the services so there is outer circle which which is general public services to public and we are we are speaking here about for digital spaces legal space the public procurement european open data and in publications information the whole purpose of our data is really providing data and information and knowledge to general public free of charge for use so this is the major objective of our institution publishing digitally so we are in big transformation from paper to digital and this is really about reusing it's about machine to machine readability we have for instance uh, the, the fact that we can produce the same publication in 24 languages you can let machine reading version in latvian uh, version in uh, maltese and th these machines are learning how, how to do automatic machine translation this is a very important uh, subject in the context of multinational multi uh, multilingualism of european institutions so we have we have machine translation robots implementing and this this is a very rare source that you have the same publication so this could be used by researchers and especially by those, those who are developing machine translation uh, products for for comparing the same product in different languages because this this robot needs to be taught they, they need to be trained to be able to translate and if you use google translate you see how it's rapidly improving based on the mass mass of inputs they are collecting but but of course uh, if you have PDF document and with pictures and so on, the machine needs to know whether you should read vertically or horizontally. So this is our task to publish it in accessible way. There are, there are also de devices for people who are suffering different disabilities, readers, text readers. And I will, I will show you some examples later on. So now I'm going back to my experience in Eurostat. So this is statistical office of the European Union. This is the building in Luxembourg where I was working for 11 years. And let me let me show you some con concrete examples of my previous experience. My first assignment was in, in trade statistics. So this is, this is an example of what we are doing with data. We are receiving data for 27 member states, intrastat, extrastat. We are, we are verifying completeness. We are validating. We are processing, aggregating, and disseminating, and quality control. On the left, this is so-called so um, seasonal adjustment process, where we are producing different indices. This is trade data, so we are make, making this, uh, this flows more, more smooth. On the other hand, this was one of few research projects I have had this is about comparing um, mirror flows in trade. This was trade between Germany and Slovakia, the motor cars. If you are, Slovakia is exporting to Germany, in principle, the same amount should be imported to Germany, but they are different thresholds, time delays. So we were, tr we were trying to find outliers. An outlier might be an error in statistics, but might be also a fraud, because uh, there, is all, <laughs> there is VAT included. Uh, you can imagine that not all actors uh, are freely declaring what they are tra transferring. So this, this is also a way to find um, discrepancies in trade flow. So this was one, one piece of small research we have done with my colleague in Eurostat. This was also having an interesting part when we were going for compliance mission during trade statistics. So we visited countries. This was example from Bulgaria. Is there somebody from Bulgaria here? No. So uh, it was 2008, we, we usually went uh, to visit uh, because this, this was sort, sort of light audit. We were looking how they are collecting data, how they are processing the time. There was not everything on electronic. There were a lot of manual checks, paper checks, uh, validation of data. So this, we were coming uh, to many member states and we were trying to harmonize, uh, standardize, compare, so to ensure that, the, that they are fulfilling the quality requirements. And, that, that was really the important part of methodology that we have a common understanding, interpretation of different modes of trans Just basic vocabularies, like uh, you call the same country in, in same system. You, 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 some say, may say UK, some may say GB. But if you want to aggregate data, you must know this is this and this. But if you go to gender, this is getting so, super complicated. There are about nine different con concepts across member states regarding the, uh, the gender. Now it's getting really 
a very very hot topic. So I, I, I will not continue on this. Another example is uh, a piece of research I, I have done when I was in charge. Uh, so I started in Eurostat in trade statistics, then I was in, in charge of IT infrastructure, and then I was in charge of metadata and standards. So I was in charge of three different units. And here, I uh, this was my last assignment. We were in charge of a statistical SDM standard, statistical data and metadata exchange. This was about harmonization of metadata with international institutions such as United Nations, OECD, IMF, World Bank, and so on. So we are trying to use the same standard for transmitting the data. On the right-hand side, this is a very recent product. This is called Statistics Explain. You can find it on the website of Eurostat. This is about energy prices, a very, very, let's say, important topic these days. So uh, there will be actually an update later this, uh, later this week on, on these statistics. This is a, another example from opportunities to share and to be part of global community. We, I was participating on this uh, SDMX uh, global conference in, in Bangkok, Thailand in 2015, United Nations Center. So we, it, 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 it is, it is uh, having also quite important international impact. The work of Eurostat is big actor, and you can see it here. But this is this standard where we have this, all, all these seven institutions, Eurostat, IMF, Bank for uh, International Settlements, United Nations, World Bank, OECD, and European Central Bank. These seven institutions are really sponsors of this, of this uh, project. The last, uh, the second slide shows the picture of my last days in, uh, in, in Eurostat. Uh, I was not living voluntarily. We had a very, very competent uh, the vice, vice president of the commission. You probably heard the name, Kristalina Georgieva. She was at the time uh, uh, head of uh, administration of the European institutions, and she said every head of unit must take rotation after certain years. I, this was set to 10 years. I was already 11 years serving in Eurostat, so I was really put to the market, and I was trying to find a job, and still trying to stay in Luxembourg, and I was lucky that I was finding an interesting job in publications. So, so the, day, the, the next day, I, I started in uh, 1st January 2017 in publications office, and this is really the print, uh, print screen of the portal I'm managing, you can you can access it directly and you scan. I, I hope it works. And here I am. Uh, I am uh, in personally responsible for this collection, which is called EU Who This is the directory of EU institutions. So I I have to make sure that everybody is there. Up to all the names are correct, up to date. It, it's automatic. Uh, it's it's automatic processing. But we are updating twice a month and. This is quite important when there are political changes because all these institutions have their, their, their represent, they are, for instance, heads of state. So if there are uh, frequent changes, you, uh, you go to our EU and you should know who is head of each, of each government who is actually representing the uh, EU in the European Council or representing the country in the European Council. But what I'm really proud of is, is, is this, this small thing here. This is the chatbot. We are developing, and I will go, give you uh, more details now in the next slide. So we, we, we call it Publio, and it's still in the process of development. It, it's a chatbot. What is chatbot? Chatbot is, is a robot with, which is processing chat. So you are speaking, and it's transferring uh, your speech to, uh, to to text. This is this is a, this is very complicated artificial intelligence uh, technology behind that. We have external contractors. We are not really experts for everything, but we have started this development last year, and now we are, we are advancing quite well. We have here, uh, for the moment, we are covering two languages, English and French. We have possibility to interact in text and speech, and we have to collection EU law and EU publications. So we are investing and we are willing to continue with this project. This is supposed to facilitate the life of people who are disabled and so on. Uh, Accessibility and usability, Any, some, something very concrete, how, how we are really adjusting our websites to people, or, or not only to people, but to different devices. If you have nicely something displayed on, on your screen, big screen, suddenly you use your new model of, uh, of, of mobile phone, smartphone, and, and you cannot access because there is wrong design. So we are verifying websites, what we are producing for our clients. This is our 
of free ordering of publications. And if this is not working on some device, we need to adjust the website to be accessible. Then we have example of people who are blind. You have these readers. If, 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 if the metadata and tags are not properly following the logic or menus, you cannot access. So this is our task that you have. You, you, can, you can access, uh, uh, you, the reader can access all the information of the website and you know that everything is accessible. And, and finally, you have, you have also people who are not able to use a mouse. So you have, you have to have a website which you access only with the keyboard. And if you are filling some surveys, formulas, you know it's not nice to have one piece of mouse. And it's, it's really adjusting websites to be accessible with keyboard only. So this, this, is, this is a very concrete example of, of the work we are, we are doing with our websites. And this is even more advanced. This is so-called Q&A. Uh, this is Google-like search. We are, so far, if we were like searching documents, normally it searches the title, metadata, who is the author, what is the language, when was it produced, and so on. But now, take an example. What, what is the global annual profit from trafficking humans? This technology should really go through the contents of the documents and find, find a piece of text in concrete document which will be then described as, as a featured snip, snippet, a piece of text, and this will give you a source of the document and the, it's finding the information. But it, it's already what Google is doing, but it, it's not so easy. And it is very complicated uh, technology. Again, we have, we have external contractors working for us on this. And now, uh, I wish to show you a very short, uh, short video, which is promoting our, uh, our work on, on uh, which is called the data tone, just two, two minutes. <laughs> Open data fuels innovation, making the world a better place for all. Thanks to the visualization of data, we can test different options without directly affecting citizens. How do we go beyond data intelligence, i.e. how do we go beyond providing insight as a result of open data? Many institutions act, uh, produce the data sets in a messy way. We want data to flow. Data must be able to flow amongst member states and between sectors. Visualizing is not decorating, it is analyzing, it is thinking, it is empathizing, it is relating. We decided to visualize each single European municipality through a density top map with more than 100,000 dots. All these applications have been built by private organizations, startups and private companies, thanks to open data, and they have really facilitated the use of public transport and, and carpooling and this kind of thing. So if we want to take a more equitable, inclusive approach, we probably want to try a phrase, a word, a term that is more inclusive and references people, not the color of their skin. We are about to witness two things today. First, the power of EU open data, but also the talent of tech savvy young people from all over Europe and beyond. The participating teams put together different data sets and come up with something never heard before. We see what simplicity they've been able to achieve out of the knowledge that they've collected and at the same time the complexity that they're able to present us with. First of all, we weren't expecting that. Thank you so much. This has really been an absolutely great adventure and we really look forward to keep working on the app. We have lots of ideas for 2022. Okay. So uh, this is really the, the event we are we are organizing Probably. the videos coming after. I should stop it. Okay. Um, so, let me continue. Next part is really dedicated to what, how you can access data which you, you can reuse for the research. So, this is an example of Eurostat Data Browser. We access trade data, they are downloadable. This is an example of Cordis, another product I have mentioned. You, 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 for instance, I was searching here, search, 
and you can find who are the beneficiaries if Sergio was benefiting from this score this program and then you have results and you can you can have quick access to public peer review articles and we, I have found this very recent article fully accessible on this score this website so so it, it's it's also good a good source for for information open data this is really about the, the, the datathon we are organizing datathon and database which was now merged to you you the open database but uh, I, I know I am running out of time, so I am trying to be quick. <laughs> uh, I wish just to explain you what is it about this, this data tons and open data. You, you are finding data about COVID, then you are finding some geolocations, and you, you, want, you want to visualize this data, where is this COVID on, on the map? So you have, uh, you have some names, but you don't have coordinates, so you need to find geodata with country, because geodata means there are GPS positions, and this uh, this, uh, this is the work for, for some IT specialists, the JSON format, and you are merging this data together, and then you, you can make nice math with incidents, and it can be the, the, the level of detail could be as, as you wish to define it. So our role is to provide this data, which are open, and this data is about organizing worldwide competition, and first prize is, I think, 20,000 euros. So there are companies from all around the world Competing and they have to reuse the data with the local sources, and they they can they can uh, they are competing and it's online. The, the, the next uh, actually uh, this 2022 version will be next week. And now I think this is probably most uh, relevant for you. This is about working opportunities. Uh, we, we are looking for all kind of professions in the European institutions. There are a lot of uh, language specialists, but uh, we we have economists, auditors, and so on. Uh, who is who is eligible? So, in principle, uh, you you must be EU citizen. But uh, it, I, I see a lot of people having dual citizenship. I have colleagues coming from from the, uh, South, uh, South Central America, working in my unit. So, if you have uh, a double nationality, it's no problem. Um, but there are also opportunities for people working uh, outside EU. These are these are so-called blue book trainees. So they are they are uh, they are different projects uh, programs for for young people who, who can who can work in EU institutions and they are not not members of of EU. A selection pro process uh, for for officials it's a very lengthy process. It is one and a half year. I I, I can tell you it it, it 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 is it is quite quite complicated. You can go to this EPSO website and and there is there is there is uh, there are all competitions uh, that they published and they are ongoing. Trainingship. So this is really for for this uh, short term period. The next uh, training uh, possibility. They are always coming from January, first March to July and first October. So next next uh, period will be starting uh, in, in in March. Uh, it's it's usually work in Brussels, or Luxembourg, or representations. And uh, this is uh, this is this is no citizens, no EU citizenship is needed, no age limit. So this is quite. Open, but of course it's quite competitive. You can see we have normally 12,000 applicants, and successful amount of applicants is about 900. So the next uh, next uh, opportunity is January 23 for October traineeship, uh, and there is the web reference. And another program which is quite important for young people is Erasmus. There was Erasmus. There is now there is Erasmus Plus. Which is the new new generation? Even more money is dedicated to exchange of students, vocational training, but not only that. There is also there are also cooperation projects. Big amount of money, 26 billion, 10, 10 million participants across the EU. So this is really important program opportunity, and I think we are coming to the last slide, Q and A. So thank you for your attention, and the floor is open. <laughs> you are on the. Uh, I wasn't. I wasn't uh, expecting that you will make it a really like on the time, perfectly on time. Uh, and uh, but we just like skipped over a lot of uh, or went very fast over a lot of things about uh, the traineeship and uh, work. So if you have any questions, like I have some questions uh, uh, written down, but if you have any questions, like you have the priority, and maybe after I ask questions, you will come up with yours as well. So any questions from the floor? 
Is anybody considering to work uh, for the EU? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so these are uh, the jobs that uh, require PhD in economics. Actually, if it was like for at the department of a bachelor, I I, 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 I have applied for for a permanent job uh, as economist and. I, I, I am an electrical engineer. This is not sufficient. So if, if I wouldn't have my search diploma, I would not be eligible. So I, I have really, I, I don't even know how many of our colleagues are, are uh, PhD graduates. Uh, we have a lot of them experts in different areas and we don't use uh, titles in commission. Everybody has only name and surname. But we, I, I realize, for instance, this Ivo Volman, he is now director in DigiConnect. He's really shaping how, how the data will be used in different open spaces, how to, uh, how to tackle privacy, um, exchange of data with the United States and so on. So, so there are a lot of people with PhDs and they have a very different profiles. I, I, I can say that there are, there are, this is one of the eligibility criteria and depends on which kind of, which kind of profile you would be looking for. But, uh, but if I wouldn't have PhD from such, I would not be even admitted to the competition. Using anything that you've learned at Well, uh, the trade statistics, uh, it was really about, uh, about um, data analytics, and I'm still considering to go back to the statistics one day. But uh, for the moment, the uh, projects we are dealing with are quite really interesting for me, and I, I like to see future of this evolution. So, uh, it, but I can tell you, it's, it's being in managerial position as head of unit means you have to manage people. My team is 30 people, and my, I would say more than half of my time is really about managing, distributing work, making annual evaluations. So it's, it's quite administrative. It's quite administrative. If you wish to be, there are like five different levels. You are assistant, administrator, senior, assistant, head of sector, head of unit, director, director general. So I, am, I, am, I have started in this managerial position. I really didn't know that it would include uh, so much managerial and so little, let's say, touch on the data. So uh, it, it was something I just observed when I started the first day. <laughs> mm -hmm. So is the Blue Book the only opportunity for non-EU uh, people? Well, uh, there are also uh, people working in, in, uh, as contractors. Uh, this is also the important aspect. I have our freelancers here. Here, uh, I, I have now 25 people in my unit. We have 19 officials and six externals. We have one external coming from Colombia, one external coming from Mumbai, India. Uh, there are subcontractors working for us from uh, San Francisco and Costa Rica. So I am really proud to say that we have uh, collaborators working from all around the world, which was not possible before, before COVID uh, era. We were all sitting in the offices. Now we go twice a week to office and three days working from home. Uh, There's a, a general pattern, but people uh, can work from all around the world now. And this is really something which is completely new. Sorry, may I ask you, it's a provocative question. Yes. So is it really necessary to hire some people from even Colombia? to work for European Union, like for these kind of things, or are they hiring just because we have uh, some low payments that can be paid here? Uh, I, I think I, uh, well, this is coincidence. This, this person is living in Brussels, having some family uh, relations, but uh, he has, uh, he, I think he has dual citizenship. So he didn't come to, to our premises just be, because uh, he, he wanted to. We are actually actively looking for for people or, or contractors because Commission has framework contracts with companies, and companies are providing stuff to us. So we are we are sometimes not even aware where are people coming from. We are looking for competencies, and that's their job. But in this concrete case, yes, it is it is first time I have somebody coming from from uh, uh, another continent, no, from from South America. Uh, but uh, in, in the past, it, it was not possible. But um, I can tell you, in, in terms of salaries, Luxembourg is very in very difficult situation because there are extraordinary prices of housing, and a, a lot of people are concentrated in Brussels, and very few people are interested to, to go to Luxembourg. We have so-called correction coefficients for salaries if you are working in Dublin or if you are working in, in Copenhagen. 
you will have different salary than if you are working in Brussels and Luxembourg. But Brussels and Luxembourg are at the same level. But there is the same, same level nominal, but in practical life, the rents of Luxembourg are probably 60% higher than, than Brussels because of 160 banks being present in Luxembourg and investment funds and so on. <laughs> There are like a salary tables, right? And there are salary tables, yes, which are pretty different like any other public administration. There are publications. My presentation will be accessible to you. So there are a lot of links you can explore because if you cannot access, or you, you go through the portal, you, you, can, uh, you can also look to the publications and I am open to have a face-to-face -face chat after the print. Yeah, let's ask maybe one more question. Like, uh, when you are a researcher, because basically you're aspiring to be a researcher, like, do you have to, like, are there any, like, dedicated research jobs, or is it like you were, that you were working in a unit and then you were taking part in the research jobs, like, uh, in general? Like, whether, whether you have to be a design researcher or you can work on your research while working on some other project? Uh, I, I, I can tell you, whatever research I have done, it was my own initiative and it, it was not really something that you must do such sort of research. It's, it's, a, it's really a lot uh, depending on your personal situation, initiative and interest. So you, you can do a lot. You can go for conferences. Present. If you are active behind, beside your re regular job, you, you, you have a lot of opportunities and synergies. So you can shape to quite big extent, what is your career? You, we are learning now. We, I never heard about chatbots two years ago. Now there is a big chatbot conference in, 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 in Edinburgh. And our director general, who is also not really specialized, she will give a keynote speech on that because uh, technologies are, are evolving so fast. So we need, it's a permanent learning process. Uh, so you, were, you have been trying for the EU job for quite a uh, like longer before you... you you got into it? Like, why Why did you want to do it? Actually, I, 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 I applied for a new job just uh, for, for uh, after I, I have, I was working in this U.S. company and I got my PhD and that PhD was not very relevant for my work in logistics. Uh, so I, I will say, oh, okay, there are some EU competitions. Our friend Sylvia told me about that. And, and, and I tried and I passed. <laughs> I didn't, I had no motivation to go to work because it was just coincidence. I, I, if you are too much motivated, it, it, these tests are very difficult, I can tell you. And you can be lucky or unlucky. I have very competent, good colleagues, six years and enough. They, they work as temporary agents. They, are, they have been heads of sector working in, on interesting uh, uh, projects and six years passed and then finished. And if you don't, and he has done probably 50 times this test. Nothing costs nothing. You go to test center, you try, pass or no. But... I wish sometimes these people to be officials, and I regret that, to, uh, let's say, to become permanent official is, is so restrictive and so difficult. Yes? So after completing the traineeship program within Blue Book, how much are the chances that you will be given a permanent job offer? Everything depends on EPSA competition. Really, you, you are only going to, to, to permanent job through EPSA competition. This is the only way to get in. It doesn't matter that you have been... It could help you to know a subject, but this is a multi... These questions uh, in EPSO in, in tests are... You, it's like six phases. You submit your, your CV, they evaluate if you are eligible, if you have sufficient schooling and so on. Then you, you are invited to these test centers, uh, multi-choice multi questions, and then you have... Uh, if you pass those, then you go to assessment center, reasoning, uh, competency test, and the whole process, which takes one and a half year, ends up with putting you on the reserve list. So you are not recruited, you are on the reserve list. And then institutions are looking to the reserve list and they, they can uh, choose you or not. You can be sitting 10 years on reserve list and nobody invites you for interview. You are sometimes offering yourself, okay, actively looking, but we were lucky, like we did macro, macro, micro, macro and economic competition and after the enlargement of EU in 2003, four, and we, the whole reserve list was only 20 people. Alex Chapek, he used to work in this house, was one of them. My colleague, we are actually working for the next uh, unit in Eurostat for five years, our closest colleagues. He started his career in this building and 
and and uh, so the reserve is created after this competition on contain only 20 names but they needed at least 30 40 so i got five offers and i was able to choose between brussels and luxembourg because there are less people passing this competition than there was minimum need after the eu enlargement so it was quite a unusual situation and it was probably the first and last competition that you start at the commission as head of union because we are normally starting as assistant or administrator and it takes years to get to head of unit. This was really exception in 2004 after this big enlargement and they needed to recruit a lot of new colleagues also to manage their positions. Do you have any idea like how does it look like now? Like what's the length of the list? What is, the, what is the length of the list? <laughs> uh, there are many lists uh, uh, and they are different. They are very specific. They are translators in uh, uh, Lithuania. Or this is one reserve list for very specific domains. So generalists is less and less. They are very much um, looking for IT security specialists. Really, this is the domain where there is a permanent need. Translators, auditors, economists. I mean, there are, but there are more and more specialized competitions and there are also new new professions coming. It's not like one test for all the... No, no, no. Very specific. So no, you can really take it. Yes, yeah, <laughs> you can go where as much, as many times you did. Pretty fun and you. <laughs> How far you get, because you can be stopped on any step on of this. And then you, you go for personal, uh, this rec the last stage is really a face-to-face -face dialogue with director or even director general. And, then, then suddenly, in my case, he, he interviewed me at 5 at 7 p.m. He offered me a job. So I, I went to one and a half years. Suddenly, I changed, my life changed in one or two hours. And I, I was, oh, what? I got a job. <laughs> Spanish director general of Digit. But I told him no. <laughs> and I opted for you. <laughs> Are there any questions? Other, like, public questions? <laughs> Okay, so then I would probably thank you very much for the presentation. Do we have also a chance to... Yeah, and of course to anyone can ask online. online but I don't know if... <laughs> She's my daughter. <laughs> she, she will ask like, what's... She works for the British Statistics, Office of National Statistics in, in Cardiff. In Cardiff? Uh, Newport, Newport. We don't see cameras. <laughs> okay, so if there are no, no questions from... from the online community, then I thank you all for coming. If you have any questions that you don't want to put in public, but you are fine with asking over a coffee, please uh, go to the next room where there is coffee and some of the last snacks prepared. Okay? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.